Well, we are in week two of our Christmas series, Christmas Songs from Unlikely People. And last week, we talked about the, a guy that we, that we dubbed the Silent Doubter. And this was Zachariah. And Zachariah was a priest who was doing everything right. Man, when, when, for 700 years, God seemed really absent. But he and his family and his wife Elizabeth stuck to it. Man, when, and so when everyone else was jumping ship and kind of bailing out on God, bailing out on church, he stuck with it. And we learned, and, and God was faithful to Zechariah. And we learned from, from his, and he sang this song. Um, as God proved faithful to provide him and Elizabeth a child in their old, old age. And so we learn from Zechariah's song that it reminds us that our faith in God is not misplaced. And when you have those moments where you ask yourself, is it really worth it? it what has God done for me lately? Is it really worth following God? Zachariah's song reminds us that it is, that it is worth following God, and that our faith in God is not misplaced, even when God seems inactive, silent, or distant. Well, this week, we're going to talk in, about another person in the Christmas story, probably the most famous pregnant teenager in all of history. This is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she was probably about a teenager, not unlike traditional Hmong culture, like back in Laos and even here. We all, we all know teenagers who have gotten married and sometimes pregnant before or after. That's kind of what happened here. So this is a very, very Hmong story here. A couple teenagers, they get pregnant, go off, get married. Okay? And so, but we're talking about Mary. And, and before we get to her, I, I was wondering, do you ever have a hard time getting greeted with by a lot of people or when a lot of attention is turned on you does it does that get awkward sometimes well being a gigantic white guy in sort of a Hmong subculture that happens to me a lot <laughs> so a couple years ago I was out at Senator Fong Her's victory party you know it, you probably heard of Senator Fong uh, he's a Democratic se state senator from St. Paul this was back in 2012. We got a picture of him. This was his victory. Roar, go, go Fong. And so we actually knew, he, my wife and I knew he and his brother long before politics. But, and so we actually went to his victory party. And, and we, we went in. And of course, it, this was like the big Hmong party, not like the DFL party that they did where they had lots of candidates. So this was him and all the family. And, and, we, we, and so, of course, we kind of dressed up. We knew this would be sort of a, a fancy occasion. And we went in. And normally at these type of things, I'm really used to, before being my wife, being the one who gets all the attention. Because people know her from her countless speaking engagements. Some people recognize her from TV. She, she, she was on this community access, Hmong TV, community access public health thing many years ago. People recognize her from the radio. She had a radio show a little while ago. So people are always recognizing her. And I just tend to awkwardly stand back and, and be kind of arm candy for her. But <coughs> this one was a little different. We walk in, and she greets a couple people, and then, all, and then someone comes up and, like, greets me and shakes my hand. I'm like, oh, oh, nice to meet you. Thank you. And then another person comes up and greets me and shakes my hand. And then another person, and another person. And for, like, the first 15 minutes while we're sitting in the lobby, I am getting bombarded by men in suits coming to greet me. It was the most confusing thing ever. And then I finally realized what was going on. They thought I was a politician. Because <laughs> why else would a, a white guy show up in a suit at a Hmong politician's party? <laughs> of course, he's part of the state senate. And we're like, ah, oh, that explains it. But that kind of stuff happens like all the time. And it gets so awkward when all these people that I don't know, Pofor doesn't know, the first time someone came, the first time at that party, someone came up and was like, oh, no, very, thank you for, so much for being here. And they walk away, and I was like, hey, Pofor, who was that? She was like, I don't know, I thought you knew him. I don't know him, do you know him? <laughs> we didn't know him. And it just happened over and over again. So that was a very, very awkward party there for a moment. But I was glad to be able to give Senator Fong a little clout, even though it wasn't my own. <laughs> But does, does, that, does that feel weird? You ever been at a place like that? Maybe it was like a, your birthday party where you're sort of the center of attention. Or maybe a graduation party. 
or like an overture jaw party where like you got sick and then you got well. And, and so your, your parents just making a big deal about you and everyone's coming up to shake your hand. Um, have you ever had a time like that? And it just gets awkward, okay? Unless you're an egomaniac where you're like, yes, bring it in. Give me the attention. No, <laughs> I'm sure none of us would do that. <laughs> um, but it is, it's uncomfortable when so many people give us that attention and greet us like that. Well, if you get uncomfortable with that, what do you think it would be like if God were to greet you? Think about that. Well, how would you react if God were to greet you? Okay, let's all just acknowledge right now, collectively, we'd probably freak out. Okay, let's just be honest. Let's not do the whole spiritual thing. Okay, we'd all freak out. And then about 30 seconds later, we would have our real response. So how do you think you would respond? Would you be like, no, 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 God. Okay, go greet someone else. Would you, would you be like, oh, no, God, don't, don't greet me. Or would you be like, ah, oh, thank you, God. I'm so glad you came to meet me. I knew you've been wanting to meet me for a while. <laughs> how would you respond? And then if God came to greet you, how do you think he would greet you? What do you think he would say? Would he say, hey, idiot, turn around? Or do you think he'd be, hey, sinner, stop that? Or he'd be like, God finally goes to you, hey, I've been meaning to meet you. Thank you very much. <laughs> but how, would, how do you think God would greet you? Well, as part of this Christmas story, we have this, this girl, this teenage girl, Mary, who was engaged, and she met God, and she got greeted by God. And it kind of freaked her out a little bit. So we're going to read part of that passage to see what it's like. And I want you to imagine yourself there being greeted by God. So it, this is in the middle of Luke 1, we're gonna, and next week we're going to talk a little bit about Luke 2. But this week it's in the middle of Luke 1, in between the passages we talked about last week, about um, Excuse me, Zechariah and Elizabeth and John the Baptist, okay? So if you're following along, this is out of Luke 1, 26. We're going to start at 26, read a little bit, pause, and read a little bit more, okay? So, and again, this is, this is about Mary. She's engaged to this nice, good Jewish boy named Joseph. And that's kind of where the story picks up. Here we go. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and remember that was John the Baptist's mom, that was Elizabeth, Zachariah's wife. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel to Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Here is our introduction to Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Okay, now we have to kind of pause here. You who are highly favored. A lot has been preached and taught and even created into doctrines about why Mary was highly favored. We really can't go into the rest of it until we figure out what this means. Okay? <laughs> and so, so there's some different ideas, some different views about why Mary was highly favored. So one is her purity. Okay? She hadn't fooled around with Joseph before they got married. They aren't married yet. Okay? They're engaged. And she hadn't fooled around. She's still a virgin. And I mean, I don't know about you, but that pretty much beats me and most of us, I imagine. If, can we say we didn't fool around for those married folks or dating folks? We didn't fool around with our spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend? No, nope, Mary was pure, man. So some people say that's why she was favored by God, because she was morally pure. Okay, okay. Now, some say her faith, she was a devout Jewish girl, went to synagogue every day, and she, she, she was doing it right. So some people say she was highly favored because of her faith. Now, others say she was highly favored because of her obedience. God said something, and she obeyed. But, so I think it's really natural to ask, why was she highly favored? Okay? And there's a problem with all of those explanations. And I think we often have a problem with this phrase, highly favored. And the reason is because it, for most of our experience, I'm willing to bet favor is earned. 
Okay? Think about in your families, who's the favorite kid? Okay? Maybe that's you. I don't know. You're at kind of a renegade church, so you're probably the black sheep of the family. Okay? <laughs> but if you're the favorite kid of the family, then mo- the, the favorite kids are usually the most obedient, the most successful, the ones who do best in school, or the prettiest. Those, those often are the ones who become the favorite child. So in our world, favor is earned. So when we read this, our natural reaction is, is to say, how did Mary earn this favor? But the problem is, that's actually not what this means. Okay? The Greek word here is really difficult to translate. And so you who are highly favored, is, is, it's a difficult way to translate and it's not a great way to translate this word but there really isn't much of a better one okay? so i'm going to give you a more accurate but really cumbersome long understanding of this okay this word is is a tricky verb form of the word to be gracious to someone okay it's that word grace the the word in the new testament in greek is charis is That's grace. And as a verb, it's to be graceful or gracious to someone. That's the word that's used here. But it's in a passive voice in this weird verb tense. And that never, this verb tense actually doesn't exist with this verb in other places in the New Testament. So here's, you want to know really what this means? What this really means is God saying, you who are the one whom I am bestowing my grace to. That's actually a much better translation of this. Instead of highly favored, that's a little cleaner, but really it's the, you who are the one to whom I am giving my grace. Now that's a very, that's a much more accurate um, translation of this word, but now it makes sense. Because favor is earned. Grace is not. There's nothing we can do to earn God's grace. There's stuff we do to earn our God's or our, our parents' favor. There's stuff we do to earn our boss's favor. But to earn God's grace is undeserved, unmerited, unwarranted gift from God. So, yes, this idea of favor really is God giving his grace onto Mary. Now, still don't quite believe me? Okay. Here's, here's the other reason. If you remember, if you were here last week and you heard about Zachariah and Elizabeth, okay, Zachariah was a priest. He was from the line of priests. Like, he was a pastor's kid of pastor's kids of pastor's kids. And he was faithful. He was devoted. He was doing everything right. And he was praying. He and Elizabeth were praying for a child. Notice the setup in that story. And God actually said, your prayers are heard. But with Mary, we know nothing about Mary up to this point. We don't know she was faithful. We know she was a virgin. So yeah, we know she was morally pure. But we don't have the setup of what is, in a sense, what she might deserve the favor. In a sense, Zachariah, last week, kind of didn't say he earned God's favor, but in some ways his work allowed him to be favored by God. But that's not Mary. We know nothing. Mary's story is completely different. So Mary's highly favoredness isn't about earning God's favor. It was nothing about what Mary did, and it was everything about what God did. That's a really important thing to understand about the Christmas story. Because there's a lot taught about how Mary earned this favor or she deserves this favor. And I'm willing to bet there's also been a lot said in your families about how you earn God's favor. And the good kids, the one who goes to church every week, then God loves them. And the bad kids, the lie kids, the ones who don't go to church, they're the bad kids. God doesn't love them. Okay? Because we earn God's love. Isn't that how it works? No. And Mary shows us that. And so what we learn out of this first paragraph 
is that God greets us with grace. If you've ever wondered how God greets you, God greets you with grace. I believe that he says to every one of us when we encounter him, he says, greetings, you are the one to whom I am giving my grace. You are highly favored. And that's the first thing we need to understand about this passage. God greets us with grace. So Mary's story reminds us that God greets us with grace. But that's not the end of the story. Let's read on. Mary was greatly troubled at, the, at, this, at his words. I love it. <laughs> so she kind of freaked out, just like we would. And I, she even says this, and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. If you think you might have a difficult time accepting God's grace and not earning it, Mary's for you. Because I think Mary had a hard time saying, wait, why am I highly favored? Why, God, why are you giving me your grace? I haven't done anything. I'm just a little teenager. So was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Again, that same word. You have received grace from God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give, you, give him the throne of your father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, this is sort of the, the section of Old Testament promises. Nobody saw that? Nothing to see here? We'll just lift that back up. So this is a section of Old Testament promises. All these things that God said he would do, he's now saying, I'm going to do in Jesus. With one change. And it's the last line there. His kingdom will never end. See, one of the things that just crushed the Jews' spirit was that, that the line of David, the people who God said would always be on the throne, the, the kingdom line of David ended. And the Jews couldn't believe it. Because they were like, God promised it wouldn't end. But it actually did. Until our little baby Jesus. So this is God's promise of those Old Testament promises to say, I'm going to fulfill it. Jesus' kingdom will never, ever, ever, ever end. Unlike David's. The human David, but the God-man Jesus, his won't end. Let's keep going. Mary says, how will this be? I'm going to get pregnant. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. You know, I haven't really done any. <laughs> how can this happen? Right? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. And here's where Mary shows her true character. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. So then she goes to Elizabeth, her relative. And we don't know, they might have been cousins. They might have been an aunt. We don't really know, but they were relatives. They were close. So she goes to visit Elizabeth, and sure enough, Elizabeth is pregnant. And they have this amazing moment together. And in fact, John the Baptist, the little baby inside Elizabeth, even jumps when Mary comes close. So somehow this Holy Spirit-filled fetus sort of knows that something is really good happening here. So this little, this little Jesus fetus meets this little John the Baptist fetus, and they have a little fetus party. I don't know how that worked. <laughs> but 
But she, so she goes to Elizabeth, and, and Elizabeth said, blessed are you among women. Blessed are you. Blessed is she who be, has believed the Lord would fulfill his promises. There's that promise again, that God fulfills promises. Okay? And then Mary sings a song. And again, not unlike Zachariah's song, we don't really know what this song was like. I don't know if, if she like broke out a guitar or a set of bongos or I don't know what she, or whether she just sang a cappella like American Idol style. Um, but she sang something. Maybe, maybe, maybe this was sort of rhythmic poetry or, or something. But, but here's what she sang. And this is an amazing song that Mary sings. In fact, this song, much like Zachariah's song, has also been adopted into some churches, some churches that use liturgies, the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, as, as a song that is recited and sung. And this one is called the Magnificat, which is the Latin word. It's the first word of this written in Latin. And that came from the Catholic song of it. So, so if you want to feel a little Catholic, I thought I'd break out a little bit of Latin for you. So, so here's the first line of Mary's Magnificat in traditional church Latin. Magnificat anima mea dominum, et exaltavit spiritus meo in Deo salvatore meo. There you go. Now, are you feeling kind of Catholic there? There we go. Okay. So here, here it is in English, something where we can all understand. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord or magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent away the rich empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. There's that promise theme again. So God greeted her with grace. But her song really completes the idea. God greeted her with grace. And she sings, she begins singing with praises of God. Okay? And then continues with some really interesting contrasts. Okay? Let me read those ones again. Listen to the contrasts here. His mercy extends to those who fear him or, or um, are obedient in awe of him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. And here it is. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones but lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. So God greets us with grace. God greets you with grace. But Mary actually mentions, she talks about three things that I believe can prevent and get in the way of God's grace really coming to us. She talks about pride. That, that God will scatter the proud. Mary talks about power. God brings down the rulers. And then Mary talks about possessions. God will send away the rich empty. Pride, power, and possessions. All three of those things can prevent us from receiving that greeting of grace. But Mary also mentions three things that enable us to receive more grace. And they're kind of the contrasts. First is honor. That, that God gives mercy to those who fear God. Another way sense, fear to us is kind of like trembling and scared horror movie in the dark closet or something. But this fear of God is really this 
awe-filled honor of God. So you, you want to you be able to receive God's greeting of grace? Honor him. Okay? Humility. God lifts up the humble. You want to receive God's greeting of grace? Humility. And lastly, hunger. God gives good things to the hungry. And, I, and when the Bible talks, particularly the New Testament talks about hunger, it's both physical hunger, that God is on the side of the poor. God is on the side of the hungry. And he calls the church to be on their side as well. But also a sense of spiritual hunger, and a sense of longing, and a desire, and a thirst. So it's both physical and spiritual. So Mary mentions these things that can help us receive God's greeting of grace. So, <laughs> excuse me, these things are things that we do. Remember, God grace, God greets us with grace. That's entirely him. There's nothing we do about that. But how we respond is up to us. Can we receive God's grace? Or do you have your heart set on things like pride? power, possessions. And I think when we listen to Mary's song, Mary's song reminds us that God greets us with grace, but what happens after that is up to you. Whether God continues to shower his grace on you or whether God withdraws his grace, that's up to us how we respond. Do you, are your hearts kind of stuck and focused on power, pride, or possessions? Do you find that that's where your heart and your energy and your desires go? To build, build up, getting just enough money to be stable, working harder to get that promotion, or, or power, and you want kind of that prestige, and let's face it, guys, I think, I think we're a little more susceptible to this, the power trap, than the ladies, especially, especially for you, the Hmong guys out there. You live in a culture that kind of gives guy, men power. So are you into that? Does that kind of feed your ego? And do you kind of like it when you get to make decisions over the people around you? Okay? Is your heart set on power? If it is, can you miss God's greeting of grace? So Mary's song reminds us that God greets us with grace. But what happens after that is up to you. Whether God showers more of his presence to you and more of his love, whether he lifts you up or whether he casts you out, whether he builds you or tears you down, that's up to you. And what we see in Mary is an amazing response of obedience. I am the Lord's. Do with, you, do with me as you see fit. And that, I think, is what we can learn from Mary. That we get the same greeting of grace. And I believe God greets every person in here with that same greeting. Greetings. You on whom I give you my grace. Even this morning, God is meeting you and greeting you and saying, you are the one on whom I give you my grace. And then the decision is up to you. What do you do next? Can you say, as Mary did, I am the Lord's servant. Let your will be done in my, in my life. Because I think God doesn't just greet us. And say hi, kind of like Hmong parties. You know Hmong parties, you can go up and just say hi and then walk away. You don't actually have to small talk. Like white people, we have to small talk if we go and meet someone. We're like, I ho, hey, where do you live? What do you do? We, but no, Hmong parties, you can just shake one, someone's hand and walk away. Is that what's happening with God with you right now? When you are encountering God, you are, you are encountering God right now. And God is greeting you by name. 
Greetings, you are the, you, the one on whom I give my grace. And I believe he follows up with something else. He follows up with a command. He follows up with something for you to do or something for you to stop doing. I don't know what that is, but I'm willing to bet you do. I'm willing to bet that if you can sit open-eyed and open-hearted in front of God as he greets you, I believe you can hear what he's telling you to do. And then the rest is up to you. The rest is up to you. Can you be a Mary who says, I am the Lord's servant? So again, I don't know what God's saying to you after. I know he is greeting you with grace. But I don't know what he says after that to you. Whether he says, you got to stop drinking so much. You're hurting yourself and the people you love. You've got to move out. You know what you're doing is wrong. You've got to forgive that person because you're holding on to a grudge and that anger is eating you alive. You've got to be filled with my spirit so that you don't lash back at your parents in the middle of a fight. You need to pursue me. You need to spend time with me. I desire you. I don't know what he's saying to you, but I think you do. I think you do. God greets you with grace. What happens after that? It's up to us in how you respond to what he tells you, what he prompts you. Um, so we're going to have we're going to have some worship here. And this is going to be a time for you to receive God's greeting of grace. And for some of you that might even be hard. For some of you you're like, "No, God, you know I don't really deserve your greeting of grace." If you really knew what I did, what I've done, you wouldn't greet me with grace. You'd greet me with criticism or a slap on the wrist. Well, God does know what you've done. And he still greets you with grace. So for some of you, I want you to embrace God's greeting of grace. To say, welcome, you on whom I give my grace. And, and, and you just receive that. Now, for others of you, you might be more comfortable with, uh, with receiving God's greeting of grace. But then, what does God say next to you? What does God say next? And how will you respond? And my prayer and my desire for you is that you, too, will respond. I am the Lord's servant. Let your will done, be done in my life. Um, so we're going to worship. I'm going to be down front. Um, if you'd like some prayer, I would love to pray for you. We're going we're gonna to sing a couple songs, then come on back up, and we're going to close with, with the offering and then, um, and then a benediction. Um, but especially, if there's anyone here who you've never really received God's gracious greeting for the first time, this is the time to do it. And to say for the first time, God, I accept your grace. I, I believe you. And I want to receive that greeting of grace. And for others, you might be struggling with something right now. And you're kind of tearing up, you're, you're breaking up a part inside. That I would love to pray for you to help you to respond as Mary did. You know, Mary was a little scared by, by this angel's words. And I think sometimes we can be kind of scared by what God is saying to us. And the amazing thing is she didn't let her fear stop her from saying, I am the Lord's servant. So that's my desire for you guys, that you don't let that fear stop you from whatever God is saying to you today. So, so Mary's a great model. God greets us with grace. What happens after that is up to us. Go ahead and be seated.
So every week here at River Life, we want to give you an opportunity to be generous. And our desire is that you're leading generous lives, not just here on Sundays, but all throughout the week. All right, so we've got some collection baskets here. We're going to take an offering. And also in these baskets, there are some connection cards. We would love to stay connected with you. Um, we on the leadership team pray for you. So if you've got a prayer request, there's, there's a space on the back. Just jot your name and jot the prayer request. We would love to pray for you. It's an amazing way for us to stay connected and lift you guys up in prayer. So we got, we got offering baskets floating around, the connection cards floating around. Um, put one in, grab one out of the other, uh, fill it out. If this is, your, this is your first time here, we'd love to get some information on, on you. I'd love to reach out and connect with you during this week um, just to say thanks for coming to River Life. Um, and so with that, I, I want to close in a benediction, a, a, a prayer of good words. That's what the word benediction means. And it's one of my favorite times of the service. I hope it is yours as well. Uh, and we end it every week with this. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in God's grace and have a great day.